Hey, I'm Colin with the Mod Golf Podcast. So today, today we're doing something a little bit different. We're collaborating with our good friend, Melanie Campbell with Startup Canada. And she is the community leader of Startup Peel just outside of Toronto in Brampton, my hometown, even though I'm in Vancouver now. And Melanie has asked me to reach out to my network of amazing women in the sport and golf industry, previous guests that I've had on. And one came to mind immediately, and that is my great friend Cheyenne coach Cheyenne as she goes by and we're gonna we're celebrating International Women's Day and uh, talk about all the good things that uh, Cheyenne is doing in sport in golf in, in business and to provide some inspiration for us today of uh, what she does and why she does it so let me bring her on there she is coming in from beautiful Florida from Tampa today Cheyenne how are you Good. How are you? Doing just fine. Just fine. We're both enjoying sunny days here in Vancouver and you and a little warmer for you in Tampa. <laughs> just a little warmer, but yes, it's beautiful. A little warmer. Here. Un poquito. Yeah. Un poquito. <laughs> there we go. There we go. So, hey, let, let's start off. Let's get right into it here. So, so everybody watching here through Startup Canada and Startup Peel and even on the Mod Golf podcast here, let's to pick up where we left off a couple of years ago with our conversation. Uh, well, give us your story. How did you first get into sport? You're in the sports business. So why don't you first tell everybody what you do and why you do it? Um, so how I got into sport actually is at a very young age, I just loved playing a million different sports. I, my mom used to always say that I lived in the gym. So in high school, I was a competitive volleyball player during volleyball season. Then I played basketball. I played golf. I played tennis. So whatever sport would come my way, I even tried like rep softball one year. I tried soccer another year. So sport was just, it was me. It was part of me. And I also have two brothers. I'm in the middle of two boys. And um, coming from a family, an immigrant family that didn't have tons of resources to spend on sports, we would play a lot of sports inside our house and be creative. So we would play volleyball with a balloon. And we had very, so we were all very competitive, very distinct lines as to what was the net and what was in and out. And you got three hits. So we would play like one-on-one. -on -one. So we did that. We played um, ping pong or table tennis in our dining room table. Our only thing that my mom said was if she sees one scratch on the table, everything's shut. So we were very careful, but super excited. And we used to use VHS cassettes, which I know some of your listeners would have no idea what VHS is, <laughs> but we would use VHS cassettes as our net. And then we had a, obviously a ping pong ball and then rackets that we would play. So it was just part of our childhood. Um, and I think that the thing that I loved the most was even though we didn't have financial resources to always be a part of leagues and teams, um, as young kids, you're very creative to make make fun out of your own things you have in your house so even through volleyball playing indoors playing with a balloon which took me to competitive volleyball which took me to in high school we were um, uh, provincial champions so it's the journey's been very interesting when it comes to just sport in general but as you're aware from my previous chat with you is that I was born in Pakistan so you would usually the stereotypical vision of some a woman from Pakistan would be that she's very conservative, that she doesn't play sports, that she's not allowed maybe to leave the house and play sports and all of that. But um, actually we had a like, almost like a country club kind of forum where we, my whole family would go and we would play every sport. So we learned badminton when I was like six swimming. We learned every sport possible in that space and capacity. So I think that's one of the fun things that I always love to share and like break down barriers that even though you're, you think you're in a Middle Eastern country where women aren't allowed, we actually did have a bit of opportunity to play a bunch of sports. Nice, nice. So you, even though you're in Tampa, just so all of our viewers know here, you're not American, you are Canadian. Uh, and you're based in Vancouver. That's how we know each other here. Yes. We're just out there traveling. So let's move forward here. So how did you get into the business of sport? I believe you also went to school uh, for a sports business program in, in Florida, did you not? Yeah, exactly. So in undergrad, I went to school in West Palm Beach where I studied business and sports management. And then I went to the University of Central Florida. It's called the DeVos Sports Business Management Program and it's a double master's program. So you get your MBA and then you get a master's in sports business. 
And I didn't know something like that actually existed. Actually, when I went to undergrad, I didn't even know you could study sports. I was going to become a nutritionist because that was my way of getting towards athletes or teams or sports was thinking nutrition was a way until I found out that the school actually had sports management. So I looked at my mom and I said, you can study something you love. Like my, my mind at like 16 could not understand that someone who's obsessed with sports could study it. Um, so there's a whole like funny story about that. But so yeah, I studied that, went to Central Florida, got a master's. And then my journey kind of started with working for professional sports teams on the business side of it. So I worked for the Orlando Magic. I worked for the owners of the team and ran all things ownership group and our CEO when it came to hospitality and for their seats. And we also had all-star game in 2012, which we ran. So when the all-star happens, the NBA takes over your stadium. And then you have other stadiums in the city that you also host events. So that was really cool to be a part of that and to be part of the logistics of the moving pieces of that. That was a lot of work, but a really good time. And then from there, I went to Arsenal in London in, in the UK and similar concept in the sense of it was premium hospitality where I was in charge of a private members club, almost like a country club, but within a football stadium. So you paid a certain fee to become a member and then you paid yearly to renew your seats. Um, and that was one of the coolest experiences that I've ever had. I had people from all over the world that were really wealthy in one space that I was in charge of and they were all super successful. And from time to time, I had to be very diplomatic as well as find a way to tell them that no, they could not have 15 tickets to the finals of a of a game and your allotments only four and you know and they were always they always received everything in life so who is this little girl telling me that I can't have that and I'll go you know higher up and they would try and they would come back to me <laughs> so you you learn a lot as you move from country to country and from different sporting teams as well you learn a lot about yourself along with people um, and one of my favorite things to tell people is that nobody ever teaches you in school as to how to greet somebody. But when I worked for Arsenal, I had to learn very fast. How do you greet lords and ladies? How many kisses do people from Switzerland and Belgium? They usually do kisses. Um, some people from England do one kiss in North America. We do a handshake. So at first when everyone was coming in for kisses, I was like, what is going on? They're like in my personal space, but that was very natural and normal to them. So you very fast learn the greeting is the first thing and depends on country you're from is very different. So something as simple as that is something you can learn if you work for a sports team in England. <laughs> there we go. I, I'm sure it's different during uh, during these COVID times a little bit. Oh, here. yes. Sure that's completely changed COVID. again. So so here, so, so let's so we don't want to spend a couple of minutes here with, with yes. you. We don't want to take up too much of your time here today, but let's really get into it. As far as your journey then between what you've done with the Orlando Magic and then with, with Arsenal, and then you've come back into golf, of course, yes. as a as a PGA, I believe a, cl a class A professional. Okay. Maybe you can tell us what your, what your classification yes. is. <laughs> I'm actually an LPGA class A professional. So ladies professional golf. Um, there's a professional section as part of it, which is where the, the teachers are. So I'm part of that um, organization. So I just got my class A, which is the last level, which I'm very excited about. Congratulations. Um, thanks. So I'm super excited for that. So the journey on that became how that started was I moved back to Vancouver after Arsenal, started my own business. And then I was like, what am I going to do now? I've worked for all these sports teams. So I became a consultant for some time. And then the lady who taught me how to play golf said, come help me in my academy. And I rolled my eyes and I'm like, I don't want to teach golf. Like that's not a thing, but I never saw myself in that position. Long story after that. And then all of a sudden, here I am getting my LPG certification to teach golf. And the reason for that was because I never really took a step back and thought about it. When I worked for the Orlando Magic, when I worked for Arsenal, I was constantly taking either clients out to play golf and or playing in golf charity tournaments because I played the game. If I never played the game, I would always be left out of the conversation and I would never be able to insert myself in these positions to meet very high level executives. So I then realized 
realized very fast that this sort gave me access and gave me the tools to hold my own out there. And I was always one of the only women that played. So I wanted to change the narrative. And that's why I joined the LPG. And that's why I became a golf pro to give more women in my demographic and age group of 21 to 45 years old to teach them, you don't have to love the game. You don't have to watch golf every weekend. You just have to know the basic golf fundamentals and a few golf etiquettes, etiquette to like be on the golf course, to be able to conduct business, to network, to meet new people. And that when you were asking me, like, where are you now? I am now building essentially a program to help women and minorities learn how do you do golf? How do you do business on the golf course? What does that look like? When do you talk about business? How do you network? How do I find my new employer on the golf course? Because all of my jobs I have received through networking, through meeting people, through having conversation and golf, as you're aware, is the biggest connector of people from all walks of life. I, so I agree. Don't play it. If you don't play the game, you never have a chance. You never have access to meeting those people. But if you know a little bit and you can hold your own, then you will give yourself the opportunity to meet all kinds of people. So now I've become very passionate. I'm going to create a program on that. So and you are and you are and, and between your YouTube channel and your Instagram and we'll leave below links to all that so they can check out all the great work that coach Cheyenne has done and continues to do in that realm and you juggle a lot of balls in the air uh and make me look like a slacker I don't know how you do it but you, <laughs> but you do true. but you do uh but let's finish up with a couple of these questions here so once again to bring it all back to celebrating International Women's Day and empowering women and celebrating women Women out there that have never picked up a golf club before, uh, I know you're a great advocate and ambassador for Women's Golf Day, which happens the first Tuesday of June every year. We participated in your event that you held at Mylora Golf Course, just outside of Vancouver and Richmond. Uh, can you perhaps make some suggestions for women, build on what you said already, to sure. encourage them to come out to realize that's not as such a great social tool, but really as a, as a, as a business tool. It's not, it's not a Rolls Boys Club anymore. It's a multi-billion dollar business opportunity right. and women need to get in there. Absolutely. The biggest advice I can give is don't try and go alone to the driving range. If you're trying to learn the game for the first time, take a friend. It's always less intimidating if you have a partner in crime or someone that you can just like, are we in the right place? Are we doing the right thing? If you try the sport by yourself, it's all the intimidating factors come into play. So my, my suggestion would be take a friend. Some people like to go with their significant others when they're like first learning because most times um, in a traditional relationship with a man and a woman, you would have usually their boyfriends or husbands or someone's playing and they're like, you know what, let me learn this game now because they're always gone every Saturday or gone every Sunday. That's currently the theme with my group of friends that I hear a lot. So now all of my friends are coming to me and being like, how do I learn this game to spend some time with my husband? So it doesn't always have to be that case. But my, my suggestion always is take a friend. Take a friend to the driving range. I know in Vancouver, we don't have top golf, but top golf in the U.S., or Drive Shack is a wonderful way to experience the game in a really fun, exciting environment as well. It's not serious. There's food, there's drinks, there's music. It's just a great hangout on a Friday, Saturday evening that you can do, which also encourages people to try swinging. And as you know, it's that one shot up in the sky that gets people coming back over and over again. You can miss 50, but it's that one that you hit here and you're like, I can do this. So that would be, that's what I would say that I would encourage people to take a friend. Love that. Love that. And you're, of course, in Tampa right now. You're going to be back here in a month or so, hopefully to spend some time in, with some summer weather here in, in Vancouver. I believe you also have a platform to encourage women to come out and learn the game as Coach Cheyenne. So to so everybody out there, if they're in the greater Vancouver area, how can they uh, connect with you? to perhaps take a lesson in a group setting that's comfortable, fun, not intimidating, welcoming, all the great things that you do to encourage people to take that first swing. For sure. So um, I usually I usually teach at My Laura, which is an executive golf course. So executive golf course, all it means is that it's just smaller and like less intimidating um, for people who are first learning out. And they've been very, very kind to me 
throughout my whole journey of teaching. So I always love to take people there and encourage them to hang out and eat and hang out with me over there. But if you have any questions as to how you get into it or how, like all, people have tons of questions when they first message me, I'm sure in your notes below, you have either my Instagram or an email. And I'm more than happy to answer anyone's questions just to, the hardest thing is to show up. That was the hardest thing. I had a lady who tried backing up four times because she tried to convince me she didn't have the right clothes for golf. And I kept telling her, you just need to show up. All you need to do is just don't wear jeans. That's the only thing you can wear. Yoga pants, athletic, whatever you want, just don't wear jeans and everything else I'll take care of. I can provide the, ball, the balls, the clubs, whatever you need. So the hardest thing is just showing up. And now she comes to me every week for lessons. Wonderful. Love that story. Love that story. So let's finish up with one last thing for sure. everybody watching, especially women here today. If they're, if they love sports, like you always have all of your life, you know, with the ping pong table on your, on your <laughs> mom's dining room table there. I love that story. Uh, any suggestions you can give for them of where to start any resources in, in Canada or even in, anywhere that for them or, or strategies for them to take that first step that they're considering. I love sport. Maybe they didn't know like you know now or didn't know before that, hey, I can actually go to school for this. I can actually make a, a career out of this. So what, what could be that first step for them to build some confidence and perhaps meet some people that, that can help them along to start that journey? Sure. So a couple of things come straight to mind. Now with social media, we're so lucky for a million. Like, there's so many resources out there on social media. My first, my first thing goes to Facebook group. If you don't know much about, if, let's say you wanted to join a golf group or wanted to know more about golf, there's tons of Facebook groups out there for women's groups and or just golf in general. So I would look into that. If you are a young person trying to get into university or college, into the, in the pro world or just even like any kind of sports, I would highly recommend looking into LinkedIn. LinkedIn, shockingly, it, I get tons of people reaching out to me when they're in LinkedIn asking me how do they get into golf and or how do they go and get a master's in sports and I'm usually leaving voice notes back or replying back to them letting them know um, I find LinkedIn is underused by a lot of young people so those would be my two because I know social media right now is like the thing or social platforms is where people reach out to the most and find after that you eventually find a mentor or someone that's done it and you'll be surprised how many people are actually out there willing to help you. I think that the and the, the hardest step is the first step to send that email with a text. It happens to me as well. But sometimes I just say, here it goes, and I press send. And you and everyone on the other end has been in that position at some point in their life, and someone has helped them out or made that connection for them. So my biggest thing is I always pay it forward. If young people come to me, I'm always trying my best to put them in contact or in connection with somebody else because I was there and I still am there sometimes. I'm always refreshing, restarting different careers and looking for that person that's going to give me that, that insight or that connection to somebody else. Love it. Use Love it. Stuff. Very inspiring stuff here today. So to finish up, I'll give you the last word. What do you want to say to everybody out there, especially all the women around the world on International Women's Day? Um, I want, I would love to say that we are a strong body of people, women, and we are a lot stronger than we think that we are. And in times when you're feeling really low or you don't have motivation or the confidence in yourself about yourself, don't be hard, be kind to yourself. Everyone is going through their own journey. And as confident as somebody like Michelle Obama or Oprah or just whoever you look up to as inspiration may look to you, they have really bad days as well. They have self-doubt as well. So I am constantly working on being kinder to myself every day. So Love I that. say that right back to you. Be kind to yourself. Be kind and generous to yourself is something I've actually got a sticky right, right above me here that says exactly that. Oh, be kind and generous to yourself because we need to do that on a daily basis. Yes, it's that's hard. Great. Cheyenne, aka yeah. Coach Cheyenne, it's, been, it's yeah. been so good to see you again. I can't wait to see you in person in, in a couple of weeks. I look forward That's to that. Cool. Are you going to be hosting uh, a women's golf day event this year again? Is that going to happen or what are your, what are your thoughts? The goal is to have another one um, this year as well. 
Um, the current problem is not problem, but I'm just traveling a lot right now. So the fun thing, speaking about women's golf days, I'm actually here in Tampa because we're hosting a golf clinic for a group called Women of Color and Pharma. Um, that's based out of the U.S. and they wanted about six to eight minority golf coaches. So I was very lucky that they asked me to be a part of it. So I'm really excited that happens tomorrow. So there's been tons of really cool women's groups and just groups in general that are, you know, finding some of the minority coaches to bring us out to showcase because as we know, representation does matter. So I'm excited about that. So that's why I'm here. And then since I passed my class A, I'll be going to the master's. Wow. So I was so excited about that. Um, I got one ticket for myself being an LPGA pro. So I'll be going to that in April and I'll be back. So fingers crossed, I'll have more of my schedule kind of in the summer months together um, when I'm back home. But yeah, so feel free to email and or find me on Instagram and DM me if anybody wants more information as to where I'll be. There we go. We'll That's leave it great. at that. Happy yeah. International Women's Day to you and to everybody out there. Thanks. Thanks so much.